Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlos, and I'll be your host again today. The whole aim of this show is to capture life stories of Vermonters and some people from outside Vermont um, who, uh, who have a story to tell. Behind this program is um, my reading over the years, many obituaries that I would finish and say to myself, gosh, I wish I got to know that person. What an amazing life story. Well, we're gonna celebrate life now while people are very much vibrant and alive and in their communities. And um, my, my belief is that everyone, literally everyone has a story to tell. So if you're interested, by the way, of being interviewed for this story, please contact me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Or if you have a question for our guest, um, again, send me an email at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com, and I'll make sure it gets over to our guest and uh, you get a response. Today, I'm honored to have as our guest, Roseanne Greco. And uh, welcome, Roseanne. Hi. Good to have you here today. Oh, it's great. <laughs> so um, when I asked Roseanne about, you know, five words that describe her, she, she mentioned environmentalist, caring, concerned, committed, and critical. So I guess my first question to you, Roseanne, is tell us about your life from, from wherever you want to start to bring it up to today that that allows us to understand those five words about you. Um, okay, so I you started with the word environmentalist, and I guess uh, I I now think of myself as sort of an environmental activist, and, and that may go back to the you know uh, my um, uh, growing up uh, in a, on a rural area uh, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Mm. Um, we lived. We, well, we were quite poor. I didn't know it at the time. I now know, <laughs> looking back, mm. we were pretty poor. Um, mm. But uh, the poor in money, but uh, now I realize so incredibly rich because of where we lived. And by that, I mean, we were surrounded by fields and woods. Um, mm. I love animals. I've always loved animals. Uh, we had dogs, we had chickens, we had sheep. Uh, not a farm, but these were just, mm -hmm. uh, and horses. And, and that's, I, um, I had a had a horse or two along the way. Um, nice. But I think that's where, and I may have said this to you earlier, Gary, that um, I have a, I feel like I've got a soul connection to nature. And it mm. came from being, growing up in that kind of environment. Our house was very small. It was like a hundred year old house, but not a really nice hundred year old house. <laughs> Pretty crappy. Uh, well, whatever. I mean, very poorly insulated. We didn't have a toilet that flushed. Um, mm. So I was outside a lot. Uh, yeah. And uh, anyway, so that I think gets me to the the where I am now, looking back, which I hadn't ever really thought about till you just asked me that question. Mm. But feeling that connection, and then. Um, Growing up with with the uh, with the love of nature and animals, uh, to becoming more aware of what we're doing to this part of our soul. I mean, we are part of it. You know, people talk yeah. about the environment as something outside ourselves. Yeah. Um, to where I am now, where my heart is literally breaking, um, with um, with the understanding of the destruction we're causing uh, mm -hmm. by the way we live and the choices we make. So. Um, mm. That's, I guess, where I am now from where I was uh, gotcha. as far as environmental. And um, gotcha. I can tell you a bit about the other ones because as you say this, and I guess we'll probably get into this, but because um, uh, I just thought about this as you sent me some questions in advance and I was sort of thinking mm -hmm. about it. I mentioned in those phrase, those words committed, and by that yes. I don't mean locked up, although I bet you there's some people who would like to do that to me? <laughs> but it is more my upbringing. I was born um, uh, and then two weeks later baptized Catholic and came from a mm -hmm. very strong uh, Catholic religious family, mm -hmm. uh, taught by nuns all the way. Uh, I even probably talk about this. I even entered the convent and was a nun um, for yeah. six and a half years until I was kicked out. But anyway, that, that's another story. But um, <laughs> but but one of the... <laughs> One of the things that the nuns taught us 
they use the word perseverance, which mm-hmm. I use the word commitment. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is you are dedicated to something and you stick with it. I, mm-hmm. I know I have been a thorn in many a person, organization, uh, entity side because I sort of never give up. It's like, um, mm-hmm. what was that movie, um, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, where they're being followed by uh, the law, you know, yeah. and they keep saying, right. who are those guys? Well, I am one of those guys, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, I'm going to stick well, anyway. So that's yes. where the commitment part comes. Yeah. Gotcha. And that's, um, that's expressed itself as an adult. And I know your involvement in uh, South Burlington City Council and um, and I, we, we'll talk later probably about the F-35 and things like oh, that, yeah. but right. yeah, for sure. Yeah, so tell us more about that early life of yours. So very religious, Catholic, mm-hmm. out in nature. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a very loving family. Um, go on. Well, <laughs> if you want me to be honest, <laughs> absolutely, uh, I will sure. tell you the truth uh, because I think... Uh, the truth helps, um, you know, the whole set you're free, but that I, I consider myself free from that. But it also uh, telling my story gives permission for other people to tell their stories because that's right. shame or stuff that's sometimes associated with negative stuff, you know, gets buried and then it never gets solved, you know. Yep. So, um, yeah, so I was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, 1948. And um, uh, my mother, uh, my father at the time when I was born uh, was a coal miner. And hmm. my mother, uh, and I can't remember when I was born, but you know, as I was growing up, she worked in mostly in factories. Um, she was a, you know, she did they call it piecework, um, and and so we're we're I guess now we call it a very blue collar family, and very right. very religious. Yep. Uh, I have one brother who is about uh, fourteen months younger than I am. My hmm. mother um, and father. Um, had been married for 18 years before I was born. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother my mother is one of 11 children. My father is one of 14. My mother's German Catholic. My father was Italian Catholic, but it came from very big families. And my mother wanted more children than her mother. So she was going for an even dozen. Uh, well, she only ended up with two. And uh, we believe now with science, it was probably some incompatibility, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Um, she 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 tells me she had some sort of um, I think she said an infection or something and they gave her penicillin and mm. right after she took the penicillin is when she conceived now that was 18 years of, of trying she, apparently they had wow. a great time but I mean they I, my parents I uh, were loving toward each other I never there was never any kind of conflict but my father died um, when I had just tur- I had just turned nine years old um, mm. So uh, I don't have a lot of history with my dad, except that I know I adored him. Uh, mm. I, mean, I still have those kinds of feelings. But my father, uh, he was a coal miner, as I said. Yep. And the coal mines in Scranton, uh, Pennsylvania at the time were closing down uh, because mm. there were havens and mine fires and stuff. And so he was out of work. And so um, he would go on uh, trips. He, he worked then in heavy construction. And I don't know exactly, he may have been driving equipment or I, I don't know the specifics of it, but he had to go out of the country. And I guess there were these projects. Here's another serendipitous kind of stuff. Mm. I knew he had to go out of the country. Now, at this point, I'm like six or seven years old. And he went to Iceland and I knew mm. and he was gone for like a year. And then he wow. came back and apparently couldn't get a job in Scranton. It was very depressed at that time. Um, and then he next went to a place called Ascension Island, and that was uh, in the um, South Atlantic, right off the western coast of Africa. Uh, and it was on, and he was there, he was going to be there, I think, for 18 months, and then he was going to come home. But he um, collapsed in the bathroom, and I'm now eight years old, um, and um, he was rushed um, to the nearest hospital, which which was in Rio de Janeiro, wow. uh, because it was it was nothing on the continent of Africa 
and uh, climb across the Atlantic. Now, I, I tell you this because I, although I had just turned eight years old and he died, I, I, my birthday's the beginning of September, he died the end of September. Um, he had <clears> been <throat> gone already 18 months before that. And mm. so even though he died, I, yeah. I, I lost my dad. I hadn't seen him for, I guess, I right. was, you know, you do the math, six and a half or, or whatever. Right. Um, well, maybe seven, but um Math is not my strong suit. I'm great at a lot of things, but not math. But anyway, <laughs> um, but I remember uh, my, there were two of us, my mother, um, and my brother, Joseph, uh, uh, like I said, a little uh, year younger than I am. I was daddy's girl. And I remember hearing that and he doted on me. Mm -hmm. uh, and he would, I remember I was uh, apparently a very, very picky eater. I have overcome that a lot <laughs> um, but they would have to try to feed me you know and he would come to school we went to catholic school and he would pick me up at lunch and uh, drive me um in a car and he help me eat my sandwich in the car or something like that oh, yeah. uh, so anyway uh, uh, you know long all my stories are long stories um okay. but i was so so close to my father mm. and then he died and um uh, I was, I felt as if my parent was gone because my mother seemed to always favor my brother. And the reason I remember this is that she would say that she would, and I'm not fighting, but she would say that he paid too much attention. I was the firstborn. Remember, after 18 years, I was the right, you know the right. gift from God, which exactly. is why I got in the convent. That's another story. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, and so she, I think my mother was trying to compensate for my brother who wasn't getting the attention. I sure. think that yep. you know. So when my dad died, I interpreted it as I've lost my parent, um, and. That's... And because I thought my mother and you know my mother and I were never close, and mm -hmm. I think part of this feeling that she liked him better, she loved mm -hmm. my mother better, yep. um, and I yep. was alone. I had to fend for myself because my 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 father, my parent was gone. So um, that sort of shaped a lot of mm -hmm. I think what I turned out was like I felt like I was on my own. You yeah, know, at a young age, do it. even as a young age, I felt like yeah. I'm alone in this world, um, yeah. missed my dad. Uh, and he was a wonderful man. And not just me saying this, but everybody who's ever said anything about my father praised him and kept saying he's mm. the most wonderful man. He was so kind. My mother, I find I'm a lot like my mother, who was very um, out there, uh, you know, um, we would call it assertive, you know, mm -hmm. a very, yeah. um, you know, uh, forceful woman. She wasn't mean, but she was op opinionated and loud. Um, and my father, in fact, now that I'm thinking of this, my husband and I had a similar dynamic. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but my father, according to what people, he was, he, he was fine with that. Let her be the one that's out there. And right. he was just, there and my husband my darling darling husband best man in the world um is the same way he supports mm -hmm. me but he's happy to be there he just no limelight he doesn't like the limelight he um and he takes all of my oh god that man's a saint um you know because i'm <laughs> i'm not easy to live with <laughs> um but my dad was that way and uh, but anyway it sort of shaped uh, my independence and mm -hmm. my um what I did the rest of my life. So, um, so I idolized the nuns. Uh, we were taught by a, an order. They're still in existence, such as a Christian charity, and their um, mm -hmm. their mother house in the uh, United States, in the what they call the Eastern Province, was in a place called Mendham, New Jersey. Uh, we were in Scranton, but seeing the nuns, they were well, like a lot of a lot of children. They were my role models. Um, yeah, yeah. They, you know, they were in full habit. Um, yep, yep. And they sort of were like ephemeral, you know, kind of thing. I mean, they, we didn't have any idea if there was a body underneath that, but right. you know, everything was covered and they, you know, they walked like they were flow, you know, to yeah. me it was just, and they always seemed happy. Mm. And I wasn't, I, I mean, I, re I recognize this now, you know, with the loss yeah. of my father and I turned to nature. I had uh, a horse and dogs and cats and all that. Mm. And I would, my mother, remember, I remember her telling me this one time, 
uh, I, I would go out and I would cry and to be away because I never wanted to show my emotions, even as a little kid, um, mm. uh, to my mother. And she told me years and years later that she knew I was there because I'd come back and my eyes were all red. You know? mm. um, mm -hmm. So the nuns were the ones that I sort of went to because my mother, I didn't feel was there for me. Gotcha. And, yes. And so I want to be honest about what else, what happened next. Um, so I was sexually abused um, mm. by a, a male friend of the family that came in um, ostensibly to console my mother. Uh, mm. I don't want to get into all the details, but yeah, yeah. she was bereft too because she dearly yeah. loved my father and to lose him like that. And he moved oh. in and then sexually abused me. Mm. Um, Sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I and I. Um, well, the the thing that um, the reason I'm saying this is because it happened, and because I didn't mention it, I didn't say one word about this. Uh, I said two words about this my entire life until I uh, got to college, and mm -hmm. um, the reason I didn't say anything initially was because I thought it was my fault. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, I think, eight, I guess, I, maybe nine uh, at the time. And I thought it was a sin. Well, in the, in the Catholic sure. Church, it was, sure. well, uh, uh, as a child. but even As an eight-year-old, right. Yes, right. But of course. I can tell you, even into my young adulthood, I still had the feeling somehow I caused it. Mm -hmm. And the, I'm telling you, I, I mentioned it twice before I became... Um, you know, free of it by saying, wait a minute, you know, I was a yes. little girl. Um, I, <laughs> I told my mother, and I forget exactly how I remember, I remember the feeling, I remember sitting at the top of the steps, we, uh, we had steps going up to the second floor, sort of rocking, knowing I had to tell her, the reason I had to tell her was I was about to make um, what they call the sacrament of confirmation. Yep. Uh, which usually happens about 12 or 13. Right. And I knew that if I, if I received the, the sacrament, it would not take because I had a mortal sin on my soul. Oh. Yes. And you only get the sacrament of confirmation once. And that is the only reason because I felt like I had to go to confession. Um, now I've been to confession because we went to confession every week, you know, and I would talk right. about yelling at my brother and being mean to my brother that was my standard sin you know right. um, yeah. but i was so afraid that the, the the date for confirmation was coming up and here i had this mortal sin on my mm. my, my soul and that i would never be confirmed the sacrament mm. wouldn't take effect so i said to my mother and, and i remember oh god i remember it walking finally walking down the steps and telling her and i don't know what i said to her but i said something and i'm not going to mention his name um he's probably long dead um mm -hmm. that i can't remember the words i used you know about him coming into my bed or um and uh my mother said to me um she would talk to the priest and see about getting me to confession uh and apparently she did and i went to the priest and i God, I don't even know what I said. I, I, I have no idea. I didn't even have words, you know, yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and I confessed it, um, which then sort of reinforced in my head, I had committed a sin. Mm. I had to go to confession, you know. Right. But right. I actually thought the confession didn't take because I thought I didn't really say everything, you know. Uh -huh. And I'm not talking graphic terms. I'm just <laughs> saying I felt so I. I found a church. I don't know how in the world I got to a church on my own and went into the confessional with a strange priest. And I guess it's because the priest in St. John's the Baptist, where I, you know, we belonged, knew me, you know. Uh, right. So I wanted to go to a stranger who didn't know me, you know, right. so that sure. less That's embarrassment. But once again, he gave me a penance. And I remember it was the biggest penance I ever got. I think I had to say like 10 Hail Marys and 10 Our Fathers, which was a big penance. <laughs> you, get, yeah. you got a Hail Mary or two, you know, uh, right. uh, which thought, and and he questioned me about, you know, something like, was I going to do it again or something? It was, mm. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, 
anyway, so um, that started me on life. <laughs> yes. Um, and so then, that, um, that, anyway, but that, so, that just reinforced this notion that it must have been your fault. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. nobody ever said, my goodness, uh, Roseanne. Uh, this is oh, terrible girl. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 But um, it's, it's, it's um, mm. you know, my rational bra. If I was telling somebody else or advising somebody else, oh my God, you know, of course. Mind, you were a little girl, a child, exactly. your dad had just died. I right. was craving affection. I mean, yeah. I was, I was missing my sure. dad. This man is now in our life and my mother liked him, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so in my, in my rational adult, I'm talking to somebody else. Oh, of course, this is so clear. Right. But as a little girl, and I carry that with me for wow. years. Wow. And um, and I'll I'll let wow. me sort of fast forward because I'll just end this part of the story. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't until I was in graduate school and I, I got a eventually got a master's in counseling and guidance. And in one of the sessions, we were doing uh, you know, we're, we're learning how to be counselors and we were learning how to do group therapy. So mm -hmm. we were in a group, right? And one of the techniques we were learning was to um, put ourselves, to think about something in our lives, put ourselves that we maybe we were harmed or controversy or something. And sure. rather than be the person ourselves, we were the person who was doing it to us. We were, so we were mm. like role playing. Right, gotcha. And um, why I volunteer, but I have this habit of always raising my hand to volunteer stuff. <laughs> um, I volunteered to do it. And I don't know if I was the first person or not, but I did. And the person I was putting myself in my role was not the man. It was my mother. Oh, interesting. And I was, I had to play two roles. I was playing myself and then I yep. was chairs and then I was my mother. And so the, the therapist who was guiding this, you know, was saying, well, what do you want to say to your mother? Mm. And what I said without even is, why didn't you protect me? Mm -hmm. Of course. That was, and, and then I realized after that, that that's why my mother and I were never close because mm. I felt like, first of all, I felt like she had to have known. I had no idea because she and I never talked about it. After that first time, never, never said never. a word about wow. it. Right. And so I had felt that she must have known. And why didn't she stop it? Or why? Why did she leave me alone with him? You know, right. why right. did she let me go in, let him come into bed at night with me? Right. You know, right. Uh, right. now as an adult woman, I'm thinking, whoa, you know, but our yeah. world is different now than it was then. Uh, but mm. I but I this is the part that is most was most telling for me and most freeing. One, when I did that, I realized that was the cause of my mother and I never, we, we weren't antagonistic. We were just never close. We never right. talked about anything meaningful. Right. Ever. Right. Um, but after that session, there must have been five women in that class, young women, we were all in class, who came yep. up to me and said, it happened to me too. Uh, uh. And the class only had maybe 20, I'm thinking 20 or 30 students. Yeah. I, and the fact that was like, oh my God, it's not just me. You know, I thought I was the one, you know, the, at fault and it only happened to me. And in a class that size to hear from, there, there must've been four or five women who all wow. came around and said, and not the uh -huh. exact same situation, but sure, they all sure. abuse as yes. well. Yes. So anyway, that, that closes that part out. Wow. Uh, but, I, I but, don't want to make light of it, but but the point no, is, these things are still happening, yeah. and um, it it a huge percentage of women, and girls. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, and Absolutely. Uh, and we're embarrassed and ashamed to talk about it. Uh, people are doing it more because thank you. of the. Thank you, you for know, sharing, though. Yeah. Well, so anyway, thank yeah. you for sharing because I think when we started this, you said that in telling the story, it might help others be able to come to grips with a similar story. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, thank you for doing that. But I want to add something onto that. And Go that on. is, I have turned out and I'm going to be, the nuns would hate this, uh, but I have been very successful in my life. I think I'm a very well-balanced, uh, intelligent, caring, resourceful, independent, powerful um, leader. Yep. Uh, and. 
I don't want the whole idea of victimhood. That's what's concerning right. because sometimes right. you think, oh, that kid was abused or that kid was neglected or that kid came in the, from a family with drugs or, right. and so they're doomed. You know, write, right, write right. them off because they'll never make it. I am um, to toot my own horn when I, and this is jumping into my next part of my life, but I joined the, the military and I rose to the rank of colonel at a time when there were very few women in the military, very yep. few women. And the, the number of women who became colonel was so small, we almost knew <laughs> each other. Mm -hmm. So to show you, you can go from being a coal miner's daughter, you know, yep. uh, to being a colonel, even though yep. you have that kind of life experiences, yep. which most people look at as, oh, my God, that kid's never going to make it. You know, exactly. so. so it's what you do with those experiences that matters. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And you're not a victim. Victim is probably the last word I would ever uh, attach to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Uh, a survivor anyway. and a doer. Mm -hmm. Well, closer. you know what? It gave me, um, this is also interesting. I've, I've had other experiences in my life where mm -hmm. I was, uh, uh, some guy tried to rape me. I, I mm -hmm. got away. Uh, in the military, I, I dealt with this. Oh, God, people were, guys were groping me and turn the mm -hmm. lights off and come into my house. And, but I don't know if it was the young, you know, but I had done that before, you know, and I wasn't going to do it again. That's one thing I, I right. kind of realized. So I right. was able to get out of all those situations unscathed um, uh, because I had built, you know, it's the kind of thing if you don't yeah. ever have bad things happen to you or face hard times, you never develop the coping skills. There's something if you live in a life of roses, when you, when you face yes. a hardship, you're going to be unequipped to deal with it so yes uh, it empowered me later on when yes. i when i met up against this similar stuff you know you know when in talking you there's this an old quote the grain of sand that irritates the oyster creates the pearl yeah yeah and so some of those tough life experiences can be the thing that makes you special yeah in the end yep. yeah 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 Thank we you, all want, yeah yeah so um so do you want me to just keep rambling? Sure, or... keep going. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the nuns because they play yes. a big part in my life, right? Yes. And uh, I started by saying, it, not, now you know why my childhood wasn't, you know, uh, right. you know a bed of roses. Um, but, so the nuns showed me another light. It was like they were pure. Remember, I thought mm. of myself as, as sinful, right. painted, a loose woman. Um, um, whatever, you know, as a kid, little girl. Uh, but the, but the nuns, but the nuns, uh, but the nuns were, they were so, and they, they looked like their life was simple and carefree, mm. I'm gonna say carefree, you know, but they were always happy. Well, not always, mm -hmm. happy. I got slapped a bit around, but that's what nuns did in those days. But, um, I, I didn't have a lot of mean nuns. They were very caring and, uh, I happened to be a, a very, and I am very smart. And so I was always academically at the top of the class. Well, nuns love smart kids. Mm -hmm. so, yep. so I ended up being more often than not teacher's pet kind of thing. So I idolized them. Mm -hmm. And so they, at that, it doesn't happen anymore. But in those days, you could enter the convent right after eighth grade. Hmm. They don't do it anymore. You actually went into the mother house and the mother house was in, like I said, Mendon, New Jersey, and we lived in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And you lived in the mother house hmm. for the entire school year. You came home for the two or three months in the summertime and then went back. And hmm. we wore a uniform that looked more like a habit. It was the ugliest thing. Oh my God. Uh, if I find pictures of that, I will not send them yes. to um, <laughs> so, um, But so I decided I wanted to go in and be a nun which would have been right at it's September after I graduated uh, eighth grade. Yeah. And uh, my mom, my, of course, my father had died. And this, by the way, this guy, after I mentioned what had happened, yeah. he just left the house. So my mother obviously must have kicked mm. him out. I, I, never, I never saw it, never saw him again. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so I, uh, my mother, um, she had, back to the, she was uh, married 18 years before I was born. She told me when I said I wanted to be a nun, and I wanted yeah. to go into the convent. She told me that she had made a promise to God um, that if she ever got pregnant, she would, I don't want to say offer up her child, but 
if if her child wanted to enter religious life as a priest or a nun, yep. she would give her child back to God. Yep, gotcha. Well, so there you go. go. <laughs> <laughs> so rather than say no you know you're 11 years yeah. old you're not right. going to go into the convent she right. remembered she promised god this and she's not going to welsh on on that agreement i guess right. so she allowed me to to mm. go into the convent mm. and so i spent um four years um in the Mal Here. malincrot convent still is in minden new jersey um mm. and then um and i loved it loved it i um it, you know in the in the catholic tradition they talk about having a vocation which is a calling from god yes uh, to do it. and usually vocations although they've expanded them now but it usually meant for the religious life as a religious woman or a, yes or a and so i always believed i have a vocation uh, to this day i think i have a vocation mm. not just to be a nun though yes right so, so i was in there for, for my four years of high school and then after high school graduation went home for the last summer and then i entered the convent and it's when i was a candidate and then that's when you get the black uh, uh long dress and that's yep. called a candidate and then a postulate and a novice um, and a religious um, um professed nun but um so then i i entered and uh i was in there for another two and a half. So it was about almost six and a half, seven years. Yep. I was the second year novice. I won't go into the, the the ranks of the of the nuns, which I didn't do well in, but I did in the military. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, at the after this, I was six months away from taking first vows. So I had hmm. a full habit. The only skin on us was this. That's all you could see in our yep. hands. That was the only thing yep. you could see. And we're all covered in black. We should have good skin. None should have good skin. But anyway, um, <laughs> so um, I uh, had gotten, this is a time, if you, any Catholics, during the uh, ecumenical council when uh, Pope John oh, yeah. the 23rd, who was, yep. he was using the phrase, open the windows up, let, let yep. the light, let the air in, let's be, you know, outgoing as opposed to, you know, we got the truth, nobody else does. Yep. And there was a little bit of a freedom to talk about things. Um, and um the they called them mistress of novices they have since changed that term because they feel mm. like mistress has another meaning yep. now they call them directress of novices but our mistress of novices went to rome for something and we got a, a substitute for a few months and the 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 sister who came in sister mary williams she has passed away she was a breath of fresh air literally because um uh, I won't mention her name. So the, our mistress of novices had been mistress of novices for something like 17 years. And she had been in the walls of the mother house. Mm -hmm. and she was very rigid, very strict, loved public humiliation. Oh, my God, oh. that was the thing. Public humiliation. It, in the military, we were told to praise in public and criticize in private. In the convent, it was just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> You criticized as a public, and if you were good, you might have heard it in the behind closed doors. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, but anyway, so so uh, the Mr. Novices uh, was very very stern and very very strict. And when uh, Sister Mary William came in, we were starting to talk. She allowed us to talk to ask questions. Mm. Uh, about, we're talking religious things, you know. Mm -hmm. and so um, one of the things that. Uh, they used to warn us about the convent was something called particular friendship. Have you ever heard that phrase? No. Okay. Most people haven't. I, I find it is, is, is something unique to the religious life and what it, we had no idea what it meant. We just knew from the day we, on the day we walked in as freshmen in, in high school, we were to avoid particular friendships. <laughs> they were the worst thing. We thought that meant you shouldn't have a close friend. Uh, right. We were always um, forbidden from pairing off two of us, and we thought it was because of Christian charity. Love everyone. You don't love one person more than you love uh, another person. Gotcha. You, yeah. Um, you are kinder and nicer to the people you dislike than you are to the people you like. You avoid the people you like, and you hang around with people you dislike. Well, that's wow. sacrifice. That's mortification. You know, that's giving credit in heaven. Makes for yeah. really you know not fun times but but i had a formed a friendship which i knew was sort of forbidden this is not sexual at all by the way no, i understand yeah 
But okay. we only learned years later after we left the convent, because I, I have organized reunions for those of us, there were 21 of us in my group, that what they meant by particular friendship was lesbianism. Huh. We had no idea. None of us knew anything about sex. Uh, I mean, it was, we yeah. were just you know, kids. Uh, yeah. But they were concerned, and I could sort of understand your environment with adolescent and teenage girls, right. surrounded by girls. And right. they were so concerned about that that they they drilled in this. Well, so uh, I met a friend and we were talking about theology stuff, but I had, you know, said one of the virtues the nuns always told us was openness and honesty, which has gotten me into so much trouble in my life. I can't begin <laughs> to tell you. But they said that's a, you have to be honest, you have to be open. That's a sign of, of true virtue. So I told the mistress that I like this other uh, girl. Yeah. And uh, so that we were forbidden to ever be together, ever talk. And then um, then this wow. new, this new mist uh, uh, mistress came in and, and I, I told her about it. She said, well, she said, you're older now. Remember, uh, two and a half years had passed since we were, you know, kind of. And she said, you know, you're old, you're mature. I think you can talk, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, we did. So we were, it, you know, when our palin off, you know, we we're just right. talking about God and theology and ethics and that kind of stuff and right. then the other mistress came back and open and honest i wanted to share with her that you know yep. well that <laughs> <didn't go over. laughs> uh -oh. and so i i got kicked out of the convent that's uh um wow yeah, that, it, that yes she uh uh I, after sharing that with her being so open and honest um i don't know what she thought I, no clue and then all of a sudden she calls me in and says uh she didn't think i had a vocation you know wow. and, uh, at this point now i'm getting a little bolder you know and i said i thought i did so uh i remember she said well we'll make a novena it's nine days of prayer you know sort of money back guarantee you know you do you nine days novena you know you'll you'll get whatever you ask for so yep. she was going to ask the holy spirit whether i had a vocation and i was going to ask the holy spirit well our Holy Spirit's differed. <laughs> <laughs> and because she was the mistress, her Holy Spirit said I didn't. My Holy Spirit told me I did. Well, bada bing, wow. bada boom. Um, yep. I'm out of the out of the convent. So anyway, that what, was the What was that like for you though? That to have your total life going in one direction and all of a sudden. Yeah. Whoop, that was know, fun. Yeah, that was probably, I'm trying to think there were three as I look back, uh, there's more, but there were some really horrible things in my life the first was well my father dying and then the, right. first, the, the, the abuse and this yeah. was right up there because yeah. when when she she said she 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 told me she didn't think i understood the vow of chastity but she was right because i had no clue what chastity was because i had no clue i mean i knew what sex was obviously but i didn't really i didn't right. know lesbianism but anyway anyway right. um but when i came out uh i was it, i think it was the time in my life where i felt like I wanted to die, you know, mm. like um, suicide was yeah. uh, something I thought about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because at that point I was like 21, 20 or 21. Yeah. And I had not ever, I'd never been on a date, never had gone yeah. to a secular high school, never held a job. Right. I'm back in the same house with my mother. Um, mm. Oh, and to make this even worse, I was told, uh, directed by the mistress to write a letter to my mother to tell her I wanted to come home because I didn't want to be a nun. <laughs> that was a lie. Right. I had to write that. So that's the letter my mother got. And years later, and once again, we never talked about it. We <laughs> never talked about it. Why, why are you home? You know, mm -hmm. uh, it was many, many years later that, and I don't even know how it came up, where she said, and I, I don't know why I told her that it wasn't my decision to come home. It, it, it was the, the, you know, um, the, the convent, you know, the nun's decision. And she said something like it never made sense. She said, because I had just seen you like six, we used to have visiting days and uh, they were uh, once, maybe three or four times a year where your parents could come and visit you for a few hours. Yep. And she said something like, well, you just seen you and you were so happy. And then all of a sudden we get this letter saying you want to come home. Right. So she suspected that that was not the truth. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so anyway, so I, I got kicked out of the convent and mm -hmm. it was horrible. And mm -hmm. um, 
I went to work in a fact, well, sort of a factory, but I'm Scranton, Pennsylvania, you know, and that's right. what everybody did. Tough. No, no yeah. one in my family had ever gone um, to college. My, my mother had stopped um, school after eighth grade. She never even went to high school. And my father, I think, went to high school. Uh, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I was working in sort of a factory-like situation. And, um, and uh, God, I always have such long-winded stories. Uh, but when I went to work in this place, uh, I walked in and I saw a, a well, woman uh, who had been in elementary school with me. Now, there were <laughs> only 17 in my class. In, in <laughs> elementary school. So yeah. we all knew each other. I think there were nine girls and eight boys or something. Anyway, and I saw the Judy there and I was like, oh, wow. Now I hadn't seen her in a yeah. long time, but right. everybody knew where I was. I mean, everybody knew I went into the convent. Right, right. And so I'm in this like a steno pool kind of, it was, I don't get the detail, but I mean, it was like an office type situation, big open office type situation. Yep. And, um, and I'm making friends with the women there, all women. And, uh, and all of a sudden something changed. I, I would go into the ladies room and all the women, in those days women would go in the ladies room and just sit and soap and gab and you know, I may, I'd maybe smoke, I don't know. And uh, I'd, I'd hear them, I'd open the door, hear them all talk, I'd walk in and everything goes stone silent. Everybody's mm. talking. And then I overheard somebody talking about a party they had had the, the previous weekend. And it was a party that uh, was hosted, well, called by Judy. The, the, mm -hmm. the, I had known yep. Judy since first grade, right. and she had invited everybody in the office to her party except me. Hmm. And so I was sort of like ostracized, and it was because I was in the convent. Of course. And, yeah. and a, another woman came to me and told me when I caught wind of it, and I, I couldn't understand why I wasn't invited. I mean, I wasn't a rabble rouser or anything like that. And she said, well, they think you're too holy uh, to come mm -hmm. to the party because you wouldn't fit in. Because they mm. assumed that because right. I'd been in a convent, they couldn't talk. I don't know what they talked about, but they assumed I would be either a wet blanket or right, whatever. right, right. So it was because of that that I decided I I can't stay here. I I got to do something. So I went back to the the sisters, the nuns who taught me, and I asked advice because my mother couldn't help, and they mm. suggested I go back to college. I had some college in, in the convent, yep. and um, and that's what I did, and that's got me to Newark State. So, no kidding. Um, there you go. I, I didn't know how to apply to college. They helped me. All the colleges in Pennsylvania had closed. The admissions had already closed. New Jersey still had some. Yep. Um, and so, so they helped me with the uh, you know, filling the forms out and getting into into uh, mm -hmm. uh, college. So that's got me to now it's called Kane College, but you know that's right. got me right. uh, to Newark State and wow. um, where I didn't meet you. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> where um, you didn't meet me. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Did you live in Union? When, yeah. So what that's... I did was yeah. So I lived uh, um, I lived in with three. Um, uh, I didn't live on campus because I couldn't afford it. Right. So I I, I would re rent a bedroom from yep. and they would have these in the housing office and I yes. so I found a um uh, uh I, this is wonderful well two great experiences one horrible experience but I I rented a room from Mrs Parker and she was a uh, um a Jewish lady who kept kosher and here I am a Catholic mm -hmm. girl so I had mm -hmm. to learn how to keep kosher uh, mm -hmm. and uh, oh my God poor I am. Um, so I lived with Mrs. Parker, and then uh, after I graduated, I, uh, I I moved in to a uh, <laughs> um, a minister and his wife's house. He's a retired Protestant minister, and he tried to rape me. Oh, um, I escaped. Um, uh, he ripped the clothes off me, so I was out there in the winter without stuff oh. on. But I I got out of the situation. Once again, I was blamed for it. You know, I ran to the next door neighbors. Um, I don't want to get the de details, but I right. ran to the next door neighbors and they saw me. I mean, he'd ripped my shirt off and and uh, oh, and, uh and they helped. I don't even know where I went. I can't remember where I went that night. Uh, and then um, his wife came home and I don't know what story he told. Probably I came on to him. I, I have no idea. But all of a sudden now I'm uh, you know, yeah. I don't know. Once I'm back into this, uh, uh, but geez. anyway. Um, so sh it was shortly after that that I decided I was going nowhere. I had a bachelor's in psychology. I was still working as a secretary. I also had a second job. I was cleaning houses and babysitting. I guess I had a third job, and um, 
I realized that I needed to get a, an advanced degree if I was ever going to not be a secretary or clean houses. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's when the woman I was boarding with the time after I left the minister's house, um, I boarded with another Jewish woman who I did, who only passed away. Uh, she was in her mid nineties about uh, two years ago. And I, oh. Mrs. Sussman, oh my God, I loved her. She was like another mother to me and uh, her children had, you know, her, she was divorced her, her children were out of the house. And, and so I, I lived with her until I joined the air force. And she's the one that told me about the military paying for your, cause I didn't know. Oh, no kidding. For your advanced degree. Yeah. If I hadn't been, had, and I always, I, Mrs. Sussman, I invited her to my, my promotion party. I invited, well, she couldn't come cause, but she came to my retirement when I retired. Nice. But anyway, so so that's how I, I joined the Air Force uh, because I wanted to get my master's degree. My goal was to be a clinical psychologist. I had taken psychology, um, uh, majored in psychology in the in uh, college, mainly because I had no clue as to what to do. And and psychology fascinated me. I mean, the more mm. I learned about people, it was like, mm. yeah. Um, yeah. And so I thought, wow, I'd love to do this. I'd love to be a, a, a anyway. So. But I, I, I realized early on, you don't get a job with a, a woman in those days. This is in the late 60s, early 70s, um, as a, uh, a professional job with a bachelor's degree. Right. Because right. I, I had my bachelor's. I'd go on interviews. You know, they'd ask me, can you right. type? Literally. And so I ended up, yeah, being a secretary. And uh, so anyway, so <clears throat> Mrs. Sussman said, well, the military pays for your advanced degree. You know, so. Um, I thought, okay, I'll go in, get my master's degree, get out, be a clinical psychologist. Yeah, yep. well, that didn't work out, but but it was wow. even better. So, so I, I, I did get my master's degree. I have all my coursework for a PhD in international relations and arms control, uh, but I never became a clinical psychologist. So, Interesting. Wow. Yeah. So that takes so, me to my um, Air Force years. Yeah. Yes, and uh, I see that we're we, our time yeah, is is becoming limited. So a couple of things. One, I'd like to hear a little bit about your Air Force career, but also when you think of your life to date, are there words of wisdom? Are there things that you could share mm -hmm. to the audience that kind of encapsulates what you've learned about this thing we call life? Yes. Um, I, I don't know where I heard this saying, but I remember at every desk I had, whenever in the military, you move around every, every three years, change jobs. Okay. I had this phrase, uh, on my, on my desk and it was, if you're careful enough, nothing bad or good will ever happen to you. Mm. And I and i don't know how maybe it's a bit of genetics part of uh, life experiences but i have taken risks my entire life mm. um i'm the one that remember i always raise my hand you you know um yep. Yep. Uh, i'm the one that speaks up i'm not shy um i oftentimes i mean you talk people talk about planning your life i never plan my life i mean mm -hmm. i, I it's sort of as if I just did things as they came and I took advantage, but I wasn't thinking that it's taking advantage of the opportunity. I just saw something that needed to be done or something that needed to be said. And yes. I rarely ever thought of the consequences of doing that. But mm -hmm. remember, well, remember, I just told you, you know, that by being open and honest and saying things and yes. risking things, I had colossal failures. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I got kicked out of the convent. Right, for, right. For doing that, right. I, I can tell you more. Right. I mean, I I got fired but, from jobs. You know, yes, for speaking but, up. But there's an honesty with yourself through all that. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're yeah, you're yeah. and and you paid a price for being yourself, basically, yes. Roseanne. Up until yeah, even well, even in the military, I'm mm -hmm. I am pretty certain that if I had been uh, less outspoken, because uh, I would. I mean, I risked a whole bunch of crap in the military, you know, by talk and mostly it was women's rights because we were like, we were ignored, yes. dismissed, whatever. Uh, yep. And I would say things. And uh, I remember one time I said something to the general, well, a lot of things, but anyway. Um, and he wouldn't um, approve me for some very high level jobs I was being considered for, you know, working mm. in NATO and, and all. I mean, really mm. high level jobs. I mean, I, I became the assistant to the vice president of the United States, Al Gore. 
Um, mm. But because I, uh, I, I probably had a reputation of being outspoken, you know, and, and earlier I wasn't, I was never rude or mean, but I learned to temper and be more, you know, phr phrasing how I said things rather than just right. saying, you know, you don't, women are not heard here or you don't promote women, or, you know, whatever. Right, but, right, right. But, um, but the, so there was a, the good and the bad side. And that is yeah. when yeah. I said those things, I rarely, I hardly ever thought, even when I got to be a city councilor in South Burlington, mm -hmm. you know, or the F35, right? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I, I didn't think, well, what could happen to me if I say this weapon system doesn't belong here or this right. is never. right. Right. Um, and so I was often surprised, I shouldn't have been, but I was at the, you know, the bad things that then came toward, came mm -hmm. my way. Mm -hmm. And they, they still do. I mean, you know, I got death threats, for goodness sake, when I fought against the F-35. Um, mm -hmm. But that's never stopped me. I never learned. <laughs> never learned. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad you never learned, Roseanne Greco. You know, our time is up sir, today, but I, I'd like to have you come back and, and do this uh, some more down the road. Would you be interested in doing that? Oh, there's more to tell. Yeah. There's more of your story. I, I, I'm. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, I got a yeah long, interesting, like twists and turns. But yes, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. Everybody had, like you said, everybody has a story. Everybody has you a story. You don't know what's there until somebody asks that's, you. You know. That's right. Yeah. Have you, is there any awards you've won over the years? Oh, God, yes. Oh, my God, yes. We but, can, oh, my God, I, I got give, a, give, I guess give me, give me one. Full of medals, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, we're we're going to, I'm going to have you back. Okay. I wanna, all right. Thank you so much for oh, today. Well, it's so Thank great. you for your life. And Thank your you courage. for your interest in my life. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Gary. All right. All right. You're welcome.